today on Let the Bible Speak. We continue our series on the Kingdom of Christ today with a look at one of the most popular doctrines of our time concerning the reign of Christ. Will He come to earth to reign for a thousand years? That's next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's a privilege to be with you and to have this opportunity to talk to you for a little while about the Word of God. You know, I can hardly think of a famous televangelist today who does not teach that there is coming a rapture of the church and a period of tribulation, then upon the earth, a great battle involving Christ, and then a literal period of a thousand years when Christ will bodily live here on the earth and reign over all of the nations until the end of time. You may have read books that picture what will supposedly be like when the church is taken out of the world and the unsaved are, quote, left behind. Or you have heard the well-known preachers on television and radio warn that the political events of our day are part of a countdown in the Middle East to the ultimate appearing of Jesus and the commencement of His kingdom reign on earth. You don't have to look very far at all to find that doctrine espoused. There are many views of eschatology today, but what I just described is by far the most widely accepted and popular theory in what is often coined evangelical Christianity. But it hasn't always been so. John Nelson Darby from England was one of the early proponents of this end time theory, and it was popularized in America by C.I. Schofield, who published his famous and widely used Schofield Reference Bible in 1909. It was largely due to the influence of he and his new study notes that the doctrine known as dispensational premillennialism began to cross denominational lines and became the dominant theory among the evangelical community concerning the end of time. Uh, Dwight L. Moody was an incredibly influential preacher and was one of the early ones to embrace and preach dispensationalism across America and around the world. Now today, it's hard to think of a popular and well-known preacher who doesn't preach some form of premillennialism. The theory hinges upon a literalistic interpretation of prophecy, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament book of Revelation. In fact, the major proof text is found in Revelation 20, beginning in verse 1. So let's read the first ten verses together. The Word of the Lord says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And if correctly read, so reads a great portion of Revelation, the 20th chapter. And I wonder, is this passage teaching that a millennial kingdom of Christ is yet to come here on this earth? Well, we're going to take that topic up in our study today, so we hope you'll stay with us for that. We'll be back in just a moment. 
you'd like to dig deeper into the Word of God, I'd like to provide you with a great opportunity to do that, and it's free. I hope to hear from you today enrolling in our Bible Correspondence course. You don't need to feel overwhelmed by the Bible. If you don't know how to study the Bible or where to begin in reading the Bible, this course will help get you on track, and it'll answer some very, very important and fundamental questions about the Bible and what the overall message is about. And uh, when you enroll in the course, we send out the first lesson. You take the time to read through it and answer the questions. You send it back to us. We'll uh, check it and send it back along with the next lesson in the course. You do it in the privacy of your home at your own pace. And again, it is free. So let us hear from you today, and we will enroll you in the Bible Correspondence Course. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Dispensational premillennialism is based upon the idea that all of Earth's history can be broken down into seven periods of time, beginning with the age of innocence, then conscience, then human government, then promise, then law, and so forth. And when we come to the New Testament, we supposedly have the dispensation of grace, otherwise known as the church age, and we're waiting on the final era of time to commence, and that is what proponents of this doctrine call the kingdom age or dispensation. In other words, we're waiting on the kingdom to come. It has not come yet. Uh, they tell us that Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago preaching the kingdom. The problem is the Jews rejected it. And since they rejected it, He delayed the kingdom until a yet future time. And He instead established the church. And we're living in that era where we as Gentiles can enjoy the blessings of God, but we're told that God really has two plans. He has a plan for the Gentiles and that God still has a plan in place to set up the Jewish kingdom and to reign over it from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the theory says that when the redemption of the Gentiles is complete, that the Lord will secretly rapture the church out of the world. And that will be the beginning of a seven-year period of tribulation on the earth. Uh, the Antichrist will arise, darkness will reign over the earth, but at the end of that seven years, Jesus will return with His saints and a great battle will take place at the valley of Megiddo in the Middle East. That Jesus will win the battle, He'll bind the devil, and He will reign from Jerusalem over the whole earth for a thousand years. And at the end of that literal 1,000 years, 
Satan will be loosed. He'll unleash his fury and try one last time to get the upper hand, but the last judgment of God will come. Satan and his forces will be cast into hell forever, and eternity will begin. Now, uh, you've likely heard some version of that scenario many, many times. But is it what the Bible teaches? Many televangelists preach that theory regularly. Many books that you can buy in just about any religious bookstore advance that theory. There was a series of books written a number of years ago called the Left Behind series that advocates that theory. But does that match what Jesus and His apostles said about the kingdom? Now, if time permitted today, we could go through the theory of dispensational premillennialism point by point, and we could look word by word, phrase by phrase, and verse by verse at Revelation 20 and learn a great, great deal. But the whole argument really comes down to a couple or three major points of contention. So in our limited time, we'll deal with those. Number one, how do we interpret Bible prophecy, such as what we have in Revelation? Is it to be read literally, or is it to be looked at figuratively? Number two, are the Jews still God's chosen people? Does God still have a plan for the fleshly Jewish nation? And number three, what do plainer passages in the Bible, uh, non-symbolic or figurative passages in, the, uh, passages in the Bible, what do they say about the kingdom? Now you see how we answer those questions will tell us whether or not there's any truth to premillennialism. So let's think about these three questions. First, how are we to interpret prophecy and specifically the book of Revelation? Now many people, including preachers, have a field day with the revelation given to John when he was on Patmos. And if you don't consider the time frame, style, and purpose of the book, well, your imagination can easily run wild. In the very first verse of the book, it is called the revelation, which comes from the word, uh, word apocalypsis. That means an unveiling. Uh, it is the apocalypse, and it belongs to a specific kind of literature that was popular leading up to the first century among the Jews. Now, there were many of these types of writings. Some of them were inspired and included in the Old Testament, such as uh, the book of Daniel. And then there were many uninspired uh, apocalyptic-type writings. Uh, these were all visions that were steeped in signs and symbols that were intended to convey a greater message. Now, don't lose sight of that definition of this kind of literature. They were all one type or another of a vision that were all steeped in symbolic language and signs that were intended to convey a greater message. Now, in the case of Revelation, it was written in code, so to speak, in order to smuggle a message of hope to the rest of the world that its Roman persecutors would not be able to understand. And Revelation signaled their victory over the crushing forces of earth. But if it had fallen into the hands of the emperor and the Roman authorities, well, they would have decimated the church for suggesting such a thing. So Revelation was written in the symbolic language of an apocalypse that Jews in the early church would be very familiar with its language, its signs, its symbols. They would understand it. But the pagans, specifically the Romans, would not. What that means is that the specific prophecies of Revelation are not to be seen as literal events, but rather as symbolic of something else. Now, how can a person read the book of Revelation and not immediately recognize that the things spoken are not literally what they're pictured as, but that they represent something? In the 20th chapter alone, where the proof for a literal millennial kingdom is supposedly found? Oh, we read several figures or symbols that virtually no one takes literally. For example, in verse 2, the devil is called a dragon. Well, is he really a dragon or is that a figure uh, that Jesus used to represent the devil in their minds? Uh, it says in verse 4 that those who were beheaded for Christ's sake reigned with Christ. Well, does that mean that if a person was not martyred and more specifically by beheading, that they cannot be part of Christ's reign? Well, of course not. That's a symbol. Uh, the dragon, the serpent, the chain, the key, the bottomless pit, and the numbers in Revelation, especially the numbers that we find all throughout apocalyptic type literature, they're all symbols that are employed to draw a larger picture for the persecuted church of the first century. 1,000, for example, is not to be taken as a literal quantity any more than 144,000 in chapter 14. 
Now the Jehovah's Witnesses try to make 144,000 a literal number. And some who argue with them, it's very ironic, some who argue with them over that then turn around and try to make Revelation 20 mean a literal 1,000 year reign on the earth. The number 1,000 is likely a symbol of completeness. And this reign of Christ isn't talking about a literal earthly government because Jesus said in John chapter 18 verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. It's not like earthly kingdoms. It doesn't have the characteristics of an earthly kingdom. It didn't originate with this world. And it's not headquartered here in this world. Revelation 20 is simply talking about the unfettered spread of the gospel. And as long as the gospel exists and is preached in this world, you see Satan has no power over your heart and mind that you don't give him. That is a critical point. As long as the gospel exists and is preached in this world, Satan has no power over your heart and mind that you do not surrender to him. There is no excuse for being deceived as long as we have access to the Word of God. Now there may come a time, and it seems this may be what John is talking about when he says that Satan will be loosed for a short season, when faith will virtually vanish from the earth. But this is all symbolically referring to the Christ's mastery over sin and evil through the reality and availability of redemption to the whole world who will turn to Jesus and be saved. And so I hope that if you did not see our last two studies about the nature of the kingdom and the timing of the kingdom, that you'll go back and review those, look them up on our website, or order the transcripts and study those because it's critical to understand that in view of Revelation chapter 20. So number one, prophecies like Revelation are written in symbolic, not literal language. The premillennial theory about the kingdom requires a literal reading and interpretation of Revelation. But number two, are the Jews still God's chosen people? And you know that's really the crux of the matter. What dispensational premillennialism suggests is that God has two different plans or programs for two different groups of people. The promises made to Abraham in Genesis and later expanded to David in 2 Samuel, uh, those are physical promises for the racial Jews or the Jewish nation. And then the church in this age has received other promises from God that are spiritual, so says the dispensationalists. So God is supposedly working these two plans, one for the church, one for the Jews. And this church age that we're living in is sort of like a parenthesis in God's plan. The church is a stopgap measure that came about after the Jews rejected Jesus and is here until Jesus comes and fulfills the plan pertaining to the Jews. And premillennialism says that God will deal with the Jews in the millennium that when Jesus comes and sets up His kingdom, the Jews will finally have all of the promises of Abraham fulfilled and the Old Testament system of worship will be resumed and the temple reestablished and even animal sacrifice will be res uh, sacrifices will be resurrected in Jerusalem during this purported era to come. Uh, that's really what the pure doctrine of, of uh, dispensational premillennialism says. Well, a few things about that. First of all, According to the Old Testament, all of God's promises to Israel were fulfilled. The nation promise was fulfilled. God made them a nation. The land promise was fulfilled. God brought them into the land that was promised. Solomon reigned over all of the promised land according to 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 21. The seed promise was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus through their lineage. So you see, none of God's promises were left unfulfilled. But we should also remember that their enjoyment of God's promises to Abraham was conditional. And all of God's promises to us are conditional. Premillennialism says the promises were unconditional. That despite the Jews' rejection of God, he, that He will still fulfill all of the promises made thousands of years ago. But friend, God placed conditions on those promises, such as the promise to give them a land, conditions that ancient Israel did not keep. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 63 says that it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. You see, the promise of the land was conditional. According to 2 Chronicles 36 verses 14 through 17, they did in fact lose the land because they didn't obey the Lord. Now they had a kingdom. 
The Jews had a kingdom, and they lost it. And not only is there no prophecy of a Jewish kingdom to be found in the New Testament, the Bible teaches that upon God casting them off as His people, that the promises were given to the new Israel instead. And thus we read in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 26, oh, what is this new Israel? What is the new Israel as compared to the old Israel? Well, listen to Paul. He says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, there you have it. Now, preachers may try to explain it away, but friend, that's what your Bible says. There is no such thing in God's sight as a Jew or a Gentile. We are all one in Christ Jesus in this era of time. That is, those who are in Christ Jesus by being baptized into Christ Jesus. Now, number three, the whole debate boils down to what we studied in our last two times together. When did the kingdom come and what is the kingdom? Is the kingdom yet to come or are we in the church age and still waiting on the kingdom as the premillennialist alleges? Is the kingdom a literal earthly kingdom to come, or is Christ reigning in the hearts of His subjects from the right hand of God today? Well, let's quickly notice these comparisons. Number one, Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. And Paul says that He is king in His kingdom, Colossians 1 and verse 23. He's head of the church and king in His kingdom. Both depict authority. Number two, one is baptized into the church, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, but also one is baptized into the kingdom, John chapter 3 and verse 5. Uh, number three, the church is an everlasting institution, Ephesians 3 and verse 21. Daniel said the kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom, Daniel 2 and verse 44. Uh, number four, the church is identified with the washing of regeneration in Titus 3 and verse 5. And yet the kingdom of God is identified with the times of regeneration in Matthew 19 and verse 28. The communion is observed in the church until He comes, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. And yet Jesus said the communion was to be observed in the kingdom, Luke 22, 29 through 30. So it's observed in the kingdom. Jesus said it would be observed in the church until He comes. If, he doesn't, if the kingdom doesn't come until Christ comes, then you have a contradiction there. Number six, the parables of Matthew 13 have long been understood to refer to the church. But all seven of those parables are said to pertain to the kingdom of heaven. Number seven, the parables, or rather the church, was established in the lifetime of the apostles when they received power from the Holy Spirit, according to Acts chapter 2. And yet Jesus said the kingdom of God would come in the disciples' lifetimes with power, Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. And finally, the church of Christ is called the Israel of God in Galatians 6 and verse 16. And then the kingdom is also referred to as that same Israel of God in Matthew 19 and verse 28. Well, that all tells us the kingdom of God has come. It is a spiritual reign now. As long as the gospel is preached and obeyed in this world, and listen, friend, premillennialism says that Jesus will take up His reign when He comes back to earth. But Paul said when Jesus returns, and the resurrection takes place, He'll lay down His rule and deliver up the kingdom to God the Father, who shall then be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 24. Friend, the doctrine of dispensational premillennialism is an imaginative doctrine that does not square with the plain teachings of the Bible concerning King Jesus and His kingdom. Won't you enter the kingdom of God today by obedience to the gospel of the Lord Jesus?
you'd like to dig deeper into the Word of God, I'd like to provide you with a great opportunity to do that, and it's free. I uh, hope to hear from you today, enrolling in our Bible Correspondence course. You don't need to feel overwhelmed by the Bible. If you don't know how to study the Bible or where to begin in reading the Bible, this course will help get you on track, and it'll answer some very, very important and fundamental questions about the Bible and what the overall message is about. And uh, when you enroll in the course, we send out the first lesson. You take the time to read through it and answer the questions. You send it back to us. We'll uh, check it and send it back along with the next lesson in the course. You do it in the privacy of your home at your own pace. And again, it is free. So let us hear from you today, and we will enroll you in the Bible Correspondence Course. Well, in our series on the kingdom, we've talked about the kingdom and how it has already come to earth, what the kingdom is, the nature of that kingdom, and we have from the Bible dispelled the notion of a literal millennial kingdom that is predicted to come to earth one day when Jesus comes again. If you'd like transcripts of this series of lessons, we'll be happy to send them to you free of cost. We'll be happy to send them to you. Just let us hear from you and request the series on the kingdom of Christ. Or if you want this particular lesson alone, then ask for the lesson is a millennial kingdom coming and it will be on its way. All of our materials here are free. We don't harangue you for money. In fact, we never ask for money here on Let the Bible Speak. It's our privilege to send you these materials and we hope you enjoy them and we hope that you benefit from them. Hope you'll tell somebody else about Let the Bible Speak and also hope you'll look us up online, our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. You can subscribe to our podcast as well at Google Play or iTunes. And you also can follow us on social media, Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to meet up with you there. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you back here next time. Until then, I pray the Lord will bless you as you seek to know Him and do His will.